All right. So this is <coughs> E six five eight lecture fifty one. So so far, when we are doing the uh, end of last class, we were looking at the following. That is, we realized that errors in the uh, thresholds in the uh, A to D converter used to make the quantizer are, uh, are largely benign because you can shape them. I mean, this uh, this uh, this error due to the change in threshold in the comparators can be uh, you know basically adds in in parallel with the quantization noise itself. So there's uh, and the transfer function from the quantization noise to the output of the data converter is noise shape. So most of the error that's added because the quantization thresholds are not the same as what you expected them to be will be shaped out of the map. All right. On the other hand, any errors in the DAC unit elements, as we saw will not be shaped because they add in parallel with the input to the modulator and as you know the transfer function from the input of the modulator to the output is simply the signal transfer function which is approximately 1 in the signal band. Hmm? So uh, clearly we saw uh, I mean uh, you know uh, therefore DAC element mismatch is a problem and we spend some time getting intuition on uh, you know how one might expect the spectrum and the output of the A2D converter to look like if the unit elements in the DAC were mismatched and we said that if you take a noisy process or a random process and which was for example only was only quantization noise if the pass vector density of the random process was like this, so this is uh, omega equal to pi and this is something and this goes through a nonlinearity. what we could expect, the spectral density we could expect at the output is basically something which does Right. In other words, the notch gets the notch basically gets filled up because various components. You can think of this as a whole bunch of sine waves with random amplitudes and random phases, with the average power in a certain signal band being denoted by the pass vector density curve. So these sinusoids basically multiply with each other, and and uh, you know, uh, and you know that once uh, you multiply two sinusoids, you basically get components at the some and difference frequencies and now it follows that when you take you know infinite number of sinusoids and multiply all at different frequencies and multiply them all together you will have spectrum at a whole bunch of places ok. Then we also saw that if you have a sine wave and pass it through nonlinearity, you would expect to see sine wave plus distortion components ok. So in general when you take shape quantization noise along with the signal this is the left side of the spectrum here this is representative of the kind of signal that you would encounter at the uh, at the input to the DAC ok. It is the quantity it is the output of the data converter of the A to D converter which is you know basically the signal plus shape quantization noise. So when you put that into a back with mismatch this is the output spectrum you can expect to see okay. and the way you can mitigate the uh, element I mean the effects of element mismatch we saw were based on the observation that if you have for example uh, an 8 element unit uh, I mean 8 unit element DAC then to generate a code of, uh, I mean, well, the input code to the uh, to the DAC is one. There are eight ways of choosing. All these eight are nominally identical. So there are eight ways of choosing a thermometer code one. In general, for a thermometer code n, for an eight element DAC, there are eight C n ways of choosing the choosing the unit elements. Okay. 
and each one of these choices is likely to result in a slightly different analog output ok however the key point is to note that when I take the mean of all these combinations it all turns out to be the, I mean equal to the ideal error is that clear so So this for example shows uh, the output of an 8 element DAC for each input code V which is shown on the x axis depending on which of the current sources you choose you can have many outputs because the current source uh, uh, you know uh, there is mismatch in the current sources so all the current sources are not the same and you can see as we expected the number of combinations possible is the largest when V is 4 when the stuff is in the middle right and for each of those combinations I have gone and plotted the analog output and you can see that I mean here visually you can see that the average of the all the possibilities seem to lie on the straight line you can actually prove it it is not very difficult at all hmm? so a lot of uh, Techniques try to mitigate the effect of offset by making the observation that the average of all the possibilities is the ideal LSB that you want. Okay. Uh, historically, the first way of uh, fixing the problem was what is called randomization. Right. So, for every thermometer code, there is a random switch box between the elements of the DAC and the switches. So, in other words, in a particular clock cycle. Okay, the first and second sources, I mean you might choose the first and second current sources to represent a code of 2, but in the very next cycle, okay, because of random shuffling, what happens is some other two current sources take the place of these two, which were there in the first and second place. So if you, if the input to the DAC was a constant of say 2, alright, the first time it is 2, that you pick some two random sources, alright, the next time there are 2, you pick some other random sources. Is this clear? Alright? And so on. So, in other words, if So, if uh, the code input into the DAC was a constant, so this is V, alright. Alright, and uh, okay, if I put a constant code in. Without randomization, what will happen? The output also output will remain constant also. However, the output will not be the same as the input. Okay, you were expecting, I mean, uh, so this is probably what the output will be. Okay. Now, if the V was varying slowly, what would you expect? The output would would roughly follow the input but the deviation between the ideal output that you expect and the actual output will remain I mean is a function of the mismatch in the current sources however when the sine wave comes back to the next cycle for example let us say V was
let us say V was an input sinusoid, then what happens? The output sequence would probably do something like this, alright. But the key point to note is that The key point is to note that since the sine wave is, is periodic, alright, without randomization, if you use the same elements to represent I1 through I7 all, I mean I1 through I8 all the time, then if you put in a periodic tone at the input, then what can you say about the output? Yes, people wake up Monday morning 9 o'clock. It will also be periodic simply because you are using the same current sources to represent each of the codes, right. In other words, the error sequence which is the difference between the input sequence and the output sequence is also periodic which means that you will get tones if you put in a pure sine wave. And just as we uh, discussed, if you put in uh, uh, what do you call uh, sine wave plus noise, you will get you know sine wave will cause distortion, noise will cause folding over of various stuff and if you had a notch in the input spectrum it will get filled. Hmm? Now if you randomize what do you think will happen? Uh, come again? It will be constant but it will not be constant. Okay, so we will let's do the simple case first which is the constant input and when you have a constant input what can you expect? So this is without randomization, alright. With randomization what do you think will happen? This was the input, alright. What will happen to the So the first time around let us say we had some, uh, we randomly chose two current sources. The next time around it will be something else, we chose some some other two uh, current sources randomly as representing I1 and I2. So the error will clearly not be the same, okay. The third time around it will be something else, the fourth time around will be something else, blah blah. You understand? But what can we say about the average of all these? These red dots, they should be the same as. I mean, if you if you wait for long enough and take a long average, what happens? We know that some. I mean, uh, at some point in time, the error is uh, some e1, some uh, I mean e1 plus e2. Second time, it is e3 plus something else, the random current source that you've chosen, and so on. So, if you wait for long enough you would basically get average out all the errors because all the combinations are covered. Do you understand? If you have to choose two current sources, for example, alright, out of 8, there are how many possible ways? 8C2 which is 8 into 7 by 2 which is about 28 ways, okay. So, you know, if you kind of make an average of, uh, you know, let us say you compute the average of the output uh, over say 100 cycles, Clearly, these 28 cycles, and I mean, if the random number generator is, is, is truly random, then on the average, each one of these choices will be chosen with a probability of 1 by 28, right? So, uh, so if you wait for, you know, say about uh, 100 clock cycles, each one of these will probably be chosen for around four times, right? Uh, and the average of, these, uh, of all these sequences will be what we expected the ideal LSP to be. Does it make sense? Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, sorry, I can't hear you, sir. Yes. 
they are all distributed along the nominal value, around the nominal value, correct. Oh, uh, okay. So the question is asking is uh, the 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 current sources basically uh, the unit elements that you that go into making up the DAC are have some nominal value plus some random deviation around them, right? So the the question is asking uh, if I understand correctly is how will you ensure that the uh, the no, I mean the average of all these current sources is the nominal? which you designed it out to be ok and the answer to that is that it is not the nominal but nevertheless it does not matter because it looks like a gain error so so if you look at this uh, this diagram here on the top the individual current sources are all screwed up ok uh, they could be two types of screw up one of course is that the nominal value of the current source is slightly different from the nominal value that you intended the current source to be correct and around this nominal there is some random variation ok so if the mean has slightly shifted that basically is equivalent to the full scale of the DAC having changed correct so I can always think of my nominal that my nominal is changed by a small amount which will basically change the slope of the red curve relative to the ideal curve that you would expect to get. But the change in slope is simply a gain error which we do not really bother about. Okay? So, what you are left with is simply the, the deviation of these current sources from the nominal curve. Is that clear? Okay. So, all right. Okay. Now, uh, if I put a sine wave, what do you think will happen when I So, if now the input is a sine wave rather than DC and I randomize the current sources that is every time I need to choose uh, say a set of current sources the next time the same code comes it most likely that something else will be some other three current sources will be chosen as D. ok you understand. So, what do you, uh, I mean, can you comment on the nature of the uh, waveform at the output? It definitely one thing that you notice is that the output sequence is no longer periodic. The error in the output is no longer periodic because each time the error is made by choosing some other two, some other current sources. Is that clear? So, it could be some So, the periodicity is broken. Pardon? The error sequence will not repeat exactly. You understand? Because you have no way of guaranteeing that any time in the future the sequence is the same. Okay? Does this make sense? So, it is basically equivalent to taking the original error sequence okay, and multiplying it by some random quantity, right? some random sequence. So, for example, in this case, the original error sequence was uh, say uh, E1 plus E2. This was the, uh, let us say the input thermometer code was uh, 2. So, the error sequence would have always been E1 plus E2 if you did not do anything about it. Now, because of the random nature, what is happening? Sometimes it is E1 plus E2. The second time around it is could be you know some other choice, you know some uh, say E7 and E8, okay. 
all right uh, third time it could be something else the fourth time it could be something else and so on okay and clearly e1 through e8 are completely uncorrelated because they are all errors in in uh, i mean in independent uh, i mean they are all uh, independent current sources so there's hardly uh, i mean it's uh, logical to expect there's no correlation between hmm? so if you take a sequence and multiply it by a white sequence what is the result if you take a random sequence say x of n and multiply it uh, i mean if you take a sequence and multiply it by y of n if x and y are uncorrelated and y is white what is the uh, autocorrelation function of the uh, uh, of the output z of n is x of n times y of n okay x of n is a random sequence okay uh, y of n is also a random sequence however y of n is white in other words r z z of n is nothing but if x and y are independent r x x of n times r y y of n i mean i hope you know what r y y and what is r autocorrelation okay for a white sequence what is autocorrelation delta of n right so what should be the autocorrelation function of r z z of n it's a scaled version of delta of n correct okay which basically means the output sequence is also white all right does it make sense and the mean square value of rxx of n i'm sorry of rzz of n must be the same as the mean square value of r uh, let me see correct the mean square value of r z z of n is the same as the mean square value of r x x of n okay in other words if you take some uh, sequence and multiply it by a white sequence with unit variance all that happens is that it's equivalent to basically taking this point putting it somewhere else taking some other point putting it here and so on so all that is happening is that the mean square value is not changing okay all right it's just making the spectrum look white okay so in other words if simply uh, so without randomization the spectrum basically looks uh, the error spectrum basically looks like this there is distortion okay and there is some shape noise all right now because of because of uh, what do you call <coughs> randomization what do you think will happen oh okay so without randomizing the spectrum looks like this when i multiply this random uh, error sequence with i mean when i multiply the error sequence this error sequence with this psd with the random white sequence what happens the mean square value of the output is the same as mean square value of this sequence in other words the energy the uh, under the uh, psd remains the same it's just that it looks white okay so this whole area is just spread into a into an equivalent white thing like this. okay that does make sense so turns out that the intuition is indeed correct all right so the blue spectrum here is the ideal spectrum 
Okay, and you can see clearly that it's all hand windowed. Uh, so you can see the leakage into two neighboring bins. The green curve represents what you would get with uh, some error in the uh, unit elements of the DAC. Okay, and as you can see, with DAC mismatch, the performance is just terrible. Right? Ideally, you were supposed to get the noise floor is like uh, somewhere around between 100. And, uh, if you look at between 0 and FB, the average gain seems to be somewhere for the blue curve is around maybe in minus 90 dB or so. Whereas for the green curve, it's only it's about minus 70 dB or something like that. So you can see that you have lost about 25 dB from the idea. Okay, so if you are trying to hit 16 bits, you are probably getting only 11 or 12 bits. So that is definitely a problem. And not only that, there is distortion in the sense that you can see third harmonic. Hmm? Now, the moment you randomize it, what has happened? All the distortion has become, it's become noise. In other words, the, the tones have been spread out, you can think of. Okay, you can think of it as you take a hammer and whack the tones down, right? Whenever you whack the tones down and the stuff up, you know, comes up. You understand? Alright? So, you can see that distortion has gone away, but you see, noise floor goes up. Okay? In a lot of situations, you know, distortion is problematic, but noise floor is not. Okay? So, in which case, you know, randomization is a reasonable strategy to use. Okay? If nothing else is possible. It turns out that you can do much better than this, uh, but uh, I am saying that in, in many other areas of uh, you know uh, circuit design, randomization has been is a fairly common thing to use. Okay, where you try to get rid of you know periodic sources of error by essentially multiplying it by a random white sequence. In which case, the uh, distortion will get converted into noise. Okay. Sir, yes. Yes. So, by doing this, as you, uh, he points out, you are not getting any fundamental improvement in, in SNR, okay? Because the distortion is getting converted into, into uh, I mean, uh, noise. However, you can see that if you plot the signal to distortion ratio, you are doing definitely better because that spike, which was above the, the green spike, the third harmonic of the uh, green curve, lies above the, the noise floor of the due to the red curve, which is the 1 due to randomization. You understand? So, this is the randomization is just uh, uh, converting the tones into noise flow. Does that make sense? Alright. So, the okay. Do you understand? So, several other approaches to uh, mitigating the problem became uh, what do you call uh, came after people figured out randomization. Uh, but in any case, basically, let us figure out what the hardware problems are with you know uh, such techniques as I said uh, in the last class. All such techniques come under the class of what are called dynamic element matching algorithms, where there is the static matching is quite poor, but on the average, okay, thanks to uh, uh, clever algorithms, it can seem as if the DAC is very very linear because of some of these techniques. Well, one we saw was uh, was simply randomization, and you need some logic before the D2A converter, all right. So basically, you know, uh, figure out which of these current sources are, go are going to be connected to which bit. I mean, the input from the A to D is a thermometer code, all right. The thermometer code is supposed to go to the DAC, all right. And the given the thermometer go code going into the DAC will select some current sources. So, if you want to randomize the current sources, what will you do? You have a thermometer code coming in and the thermometer code going out, all right. And all that you need to do is put some random, I mean, you know, some uh, some connections between the input thermometer code and the output thermometer code where the connections are all randomized. Okay, so uh, you need some kind of logic to do that. And uh, so, what do you think the problem is? 
Every time you have logic, it will introduce some delay. It takes time to do ending, ordering, and all this other stuff. Okay? And uh, at low, I mean, when the uh, loop is operating at low frequencies, uh, you know, or at low clock rates, this delay is not an issue. But in very, very high speed systems where uh, the sampling rate of the modulator is very high, then what happens is there is delay in the loop. There is excess loop delay and we have seen that excess loop, loop delay, you know, basically uh, there is more delay in the feedback loop which can push the modulator into instability, okay. And uh, so, you have to go and fix the loop filter by perhaps adding a direct path around the quantizer, alright, and also changing the coefficients of the loop filter to make sure that the noise transfer function is what you want in spite of this excess loop. Does that make sense? Okay, so let's see if we can do any better. The basic idea of yet another technique is the following. So, okay, the DTA converter sequence is uh, input sequence is V. Because of mismatch in the DTA converter, what happens is that the output spectrum is basically doing this. Correct? That's what we saw. Hmm? So, if uh, if you have a black box, okay. I mean, are we really concerned about this guy? We don't. We are only concerned about this frequency band. Correct? If everything is fine in the signal band, you don't really care what happens outside because anyway it is going to get filtered off by the decimal. Correct? So, since this is the problem, you know, we can use uh, a technique which uh, has long been used in, uh, in you know, a whole bunch of audio systems before and uh, this is what is called uh, pre-emphasis. I don't know if you have heard of this. Have you all heard of Dolby noise reduction? Have you heard of Dolby? I mean, you must have seen this in the movie theaters, right? It says Dolby surround, Dolby, Dolby, Dolby. Who is, what is this? Uh, how did this Dolby all come about? Okay. A Dolby Labs is like now, of course, very famous for uh, high end audio research, but the first technique they came up with was what was called Dolby noise reduction. Okay. So, this was in the good old days when you had audio tape. I don't know if how many of you have seen audio tape, uh, this cassette type tapes. And uh, of course, uh, uh, audio cassette tape itself now is obsolete. It's probably been uh, maybe you you must probably be about 22 years old. So about 10-15 uh, years ago, uh, audio tape was the rage. But it, during when I, I was a small kid, okay, the rage was a tape. But the tape it would be a spool. It's not uh, it's not a tape. It's not a nice cassette where you know it's this small. Uh, each of the tapes would be uh, you know about a foot in diameter. And your player would be uh, two feet across minimum, okay. And this big tape would go from one spool to another. And of course, in India, with all this heat, what would happen is that the tape would expand. So even though the tape went at a constant rate, sometimes you know, uh, Rafi could sound like Lata Mangeshkar, you know. So uh, pitch would go for a toss. Huh? But anyway, in all these tape systems, it's basically the way. Uh, it would work is, you know, there is a magnetic head and this, this magnetic tape rubbing against the head and causing, you know, uh, some indu induced voltage in the head and that is amplified. Because of this friction apparently, what happens is that this, what is called hiss, okay. So, I do not know if, uh, now with CD systems you do not hear any hiss at all, okay. But in the old cassette type stuff, bit, once a song is over and another song is yet to come, right, there is empty, supposedly uh, no volume, I mean no sound at all supposed to come out. But you will distinctly hear, okay. So this hiss is uh, uh, occurs at at high frequencies, okay. And uh, uh, you know it's uh, unless you have a loud song playing, it's quite annoying. Hmm? So what these guys said was the following. So you know that if you take uh, a tape, I mean sound as it is, and record it onto a tape, when you play back, the noise is. Uh, you know, the spectral density is like this and then kind of does some something like this. So, at high this here, this has got predominant high frequency components, 
Okay, because of the physical mechanism by which it's introduced. So we don't worry about why it's got high frequency components. It just turns out that there is a lot of high frequency components. Okay. So what do you think? Uh, so if uh, if the input signal had a flat flat spectral density, okay, the output SNR will be is good in these regions, but is very bad here. Does that make sense? Okay. So, what do you think uh, I can do? Pardon? I can I can pass the input through a filter whose response is like this, so that the SNR remains constant across the signal band. All right? Okay. And then I play back, and then I can always pass it through a low pass filter. So that the the uh, what do you call the uh, uh, the signal transfer function becomes one, okay, and the noise transfer function becomes flat, okay. In other words, the signal to noise ratio is, I mean, in other words, the transfer function from the noise to the output will become like this. But the noise to begin with had a spectral density like this. So when you you know when you cascade the two you get noise response okay so in other words uh, in fact this is i mean i mean uh, i was pretty excited when i first heard this stuff you know on a cassette player there is a small button called dolby noise reduction okay you keep listening and then you know you just flick the switch from no noise reduction to noise reduction and definitely the hiss goes away okay so it seems amazing that you can actually cancel noise but this is what has happened Okay, so this was called uh, you know Dolby noise reduction, and then you know uh, a lot of these uh, players uh, you know used to incorporate this. Okay, and uh, the same idea is also used in FM. I don't know if how many of you have done uh, AM, FM, and uh, in uh, do they still do that in the communication classes? They don't do that. So in FM also it turns out that the noise spectral density in the channel is is low at low frequencies and goes on increasing at high frequencies. Okay, uh, I think this has got to do with see to to convert from uh, from frequency to voltage. I mean, what is FM? It's nothing but voltage is converted into frequency, right? So uh, if you yell louder into the mic, it basically corresponds to the carrier more you know frequency locally increasing. To get back to, I guess, you're familiar with this or not familiar at all? No. So, FM is basically message is integrated, okay, and then connected to a VCO. The VCO frequency is is uh, dependent on the integral of M of T. To recover M of T, you differentiate somewhere, correct? So, if you when you differentiate, what happens? What happens to noise when you differentiate? Low frequency noise gain is zero. High frequency noise is the gain is increased. Okay. So, what they do is instead of uh, you know pumping the message, they they pre-emphasize the message. In other words, they pass the message through a filter whose whose frequency response is like that, so that the signal to noise ratio remains you know, roughly constant across the. Okay, that's that's the basic idea and. Okay, so pre-emphasis is a is a very uh, uh, common thing, all right. And as you can see, most of it is simply you know it's common sense, right? It's it's, it's in, if, if you knew this, I'm sure you would have come up with the same idea. It's not not particularly. Uh, okay. The question now is how do I uh, the motivation for this discussion is how can I exploit the same idea elsewhere? Hmm? So, any suggestions? See, ideally, you're supposed to get so you can think of the uh, actual D to A converter as an ideal D to A converter plus some noise okay and the ideal part has got the noise spectrum that you want the noise part has got the junk that you don't want 
Okay? You want to get rid of this guy. Alright? So, any ideas? In other words, you be you're interested in getting rid of the you don't really care about getting rid of the error across all banks. You only want the error to go away in at low frequency. Does that make sense? Okay. So in other words, what would you want to do? No, if I, okay, one suggestion is put a filter here. I mean, see this whole thing comes as a unit. If I go and eliminate low frequencies from the output of this, then I will eliminate the signal also. So, I the signal Do you see the, how is it similar to Dolby noise reduction? No, 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 forget what you can do. How is this similar? Uh, uh, I mean, do you see the similarity between this problem and the the uh, problem in audio tapes? Yes, so what should you do? If you want to eliminate or reduce the noise, what would you do? I mean, in principle, what do you want to do? You want to remove the slow. Yes, okay. And how are we doing that with the, in the Dolby example? You pre-emphasize the signal in the frequency band where there is more noise. Okay? Alright? And then, you take the output and de-emphasize the, the, the same band. Okay? So, if you pre-emphasize low frequencies before you go into the D2A converter, alright? Okay? Then, at low, I mean, ideally you would, uh, let's say the input signal sequence had some flat spe spectrum, okay? And, uh, and there is shape quantization noise. So, what I will do is pre emphasize this at low frequency so I can do, let's say, something like this. So, pre-emphasis at low frequencies is simply I take this and do this. Correct? And what happens? And to and now I am adding noise not to the original sequence but to the pre-emphasized sequence. So, do this. So, you can clearly see that the signal to noise ratio in the signal band is greatly improved. Does it make sense? And then I go ahead and filter it by the inverse transfer function. So, bringing the, the signal back to what I want. Right? And in the process what has happened? The noise has reduced greatly. You understand? So, in other words, take the input sequence V, pass it through a filter whose gain is very high at low frequencies and low at high frequencies. Okay? Then, pass this through the D2, give this as the input sequence to the DAC. Correct? Then, what should I do? H1 inverse of Z. Alright? This is the output. Does that make sense? And, where is the error adding in the DAC? The, the DAC, the noise due to mismatch is basically looking like a sequence there. Okay? This is the real DAC. Okay? 
and E is unknown. So, what is uh, V out is nothing but V plus E of Z times H1 inverse of Z. Does it make sense? Okay. You can see that the idea is very, very similar to what is well known in the past. Excuse me? Oh, uh, it's uh, where in, 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 not in this case. Okay. Okay. So, as I said, the basic idea is to take the input sequence, which is 1, 2, 2, 3 and 3 accumulated which will give me 1, 3, 5, 8 and 11. This is the sequence which goes into the DAC, okay, giving rise to the output of the DAC in principle being something like this and please note that beyond this the DAC goes on repeating. All right. Conceptually, I have an infinite DAC where I take the same current sources and repeat them all over. The output of the DAC is this guy, is this sequence here. However, this is not what I want as the final output. I need to, I need to differentiate this. Differentiation in the digital domain is basically 1 minus Z inverse, which is basically the present sequence, present value minus the previous value. So, uh, the first sequence is, uh, first point will be 1. Uh, because I assume that the previous stuff is all 0. The output in the next cycle will be the present input which is 3 minus the previous output which is 1. So, the output will be 2. Okay. The next sequence will be 2 again. Then it will be 3 and it will be 3. Does it make sense? So, if all the current sources were identical, correct, the output of the DAC is the same as the input to the DAC, of the DAC. Please note that the, if all the current sources were identical, then the output sequence is 1, 2, 2, 3, 3, as we would expect, correct. However, now what have we done? When you want 1, I mean, the first sequence is, uh, the first output is what you had, okay, normally. When you get the next sequence, the next point in time, where do you start the thermometer from? Look at the picture and tell me. At n equal to 0, you start the thermometer from there, right? For n equal to 1, so this is the, the input is basically 1 here, the next input is 2, so I have to choose 2 current sources and where am I starting from, where, where do I need to start from? I need to start from the tip of the first thermometer, right? The next, where do I, next input is also 2 and where do I need to start the thermometer from? the end of the last thermometer, right? And where do I need to start? The, the next input is 3. This is where I start from. Then I need another 3, I need to start from. Okay. Does it make sense? Okay. Alright. But please note that this is a modulo DAC. Correct? So, the output, I mean, once the uh, the pointer goes beyond uh, 8, I do wrap around and I start with I1, I2, I. You understand? As soon as I exhaust my 8 current sources, right, the 9th current source is the same as the first, okay, and the 10th is the same as the second and so on. So, basically all that means is I keep wrapping around the, the same 8 elements in a modulo fashion. Does this make sense? So, 
conceptually whatever i add here this is a periodic tone right because the input here is a sinusoid here will also be a sinusoid okay all right which means that the output sequence here will also be periodic correct this error see, I mean the input to the d2a is a, is a sine wave the output of the d2a will also be a will be a sine wave plus some error and because there is nothing here we are not doing any randomization nothing okay we simply are pushing up the uh, i mean uh, so the error sequence will repeat after so many inputs into the i mean after one full cycle the error sequence will repeat again correct and so that is the sequence that you are the error sequence that you are adding here this inl of v this this noise sequence will basically look like this so you can see that this goes on repeat okay does it make sense now i pass this sequence plus the ideal output through a differentiator right so the transfer function from here to here will be one okay the transfer function from here to here will be 1 minus z inverse in other words it's differentiating the the error does it make sense okay so in other words the error due to mismatch is getting shaped out of the signal band with a noise with a with a so called transfer function of 1 minus z inverse does it make sense okay so this is what is called data weighted okay i don't believe this is how the original authors uh, derived it okay uh, and uh, see a lot of this uh, these d uh, dynamic element matching algorithms are uh, are pretty much ad hoc you know you kind of have some vague intuition and then you code it up and and you see that you get some improvement okay uh, so it's uh, many of these algorithms uh, you know don't have you know what do you call a very systematic way of, of deriving them uh, this is okay this is what uh, this is how nagendra likes to explain it and i thought this is pretty nice elegant way of explaining data weighted approach yes sir uh, yes you want me to go over this okay what is it that uh, is confusing particularly okay so all right so let's go over this slowly again this is the input sequence 1 2 2 3 3 i chosen some random input sequence okay all of you understand why this makes sense okay this is pre and process and this is d and process okay and why we need the infinite d2a is because pardon yeah so the uh, the impulse response of uh, of an integer ideal integrator the norm of that response is infinity which basically means that even for bounded inputs you can get unbounded outputs hmm? so to prevent you know any uh, saturation and stuff like that what we conceptually said is let us have an infinite level d2a converter in other words there is uh, there are, i mean there are infinite levels we know that it's not practical so we we'll choose us since it's it's uh, it's an uh, it's an ideal thing in the first place you can make it as ideal as we want i mean have whatever characteristics we want and what we say is that you copy and paste the same levels 
again right so the current sources of the the levels of this infinite level d2a converter are i1 through i8 is the having i9 i10 and so on i will replace it by i1 through i8 i1 i2 again through i8 and so on is that clear so the inl of this infinite level dot is something like this it is simply a periodic extension of the inl versus code for a single dot is that clear hmm now let's see what how this operates so we first need to preemphasize the the sequence v and that is gotten by 1 3 5 8 and 11 that's simply the accumulated output of the input v okay so this is the quantizer output that is you know the uh, stuff that is would have gone into an idea into a that without any of these algorithms right but what we are doing is we are not putting that sequence directly into the dac we are preemphasizing it by passing this through an accumulator okay and that goes into the dac so if that goes into the dac the output of the dac is basically this thermometer here okay and one thing to point out is that this this i1 is nominally the same as i2 okay it is not exactly the same there is a small error that's what's causing all the problem okay so the output sequence of the dac again is not what is desired it needs to be deemphasized in this case differentiated to get the main out okay so what is the output sequence of the dac in uh, uh, in this cycle it's i1 here it is i1 plus i2 plus i3 okay uh here it is i1 plus i2 plus i3 plus i4 plus i5 and so on. does it make sense is it clear so i need to differentiate this so i need to take the successive differences between output samples so if i assume that the output of the dac was uh, zero to begin with then the output after differentiation should be i1 okay here should be i1 plus i2 plus i3 minus i1 that should be that's nothing but i2 plus i3 is that clear are you heard something is not clear you seem very agitated okay see this is v all right this is v by 1 minus z inverse this is the integrated version of the output correct this has to be within course digit i mean discrete differentiation which is nothing but first difference okay the first difference is basically the output sequence was was i1 i1 plus i2 plus i3 okay and i1 plus i2 plus i3 plus i4 plus i5 okay so the first difference is basically if it was zero to begin with the uh, the first difference will be i1 in the next cycle it will be i1 plus i2 plus i3 which is the present sample minus the previous sample which is i1 so the difference will be i2 plus i3 okay the next thing is this minus this which is i4 plus i5 all right and then it must be i uh, let me see i6 plus i7 plus i8 okay then it must be i1 plus i2 plus i3 
Is that clear? Okay. Yes. Uh, okay. So the question is, uh, how is this different from? Okay. Well, I mean, clearly some it's different. But what differences do you see between this and randomization? Pardon? I mean, there's some method in this madness, right? So, uh, I mean, if you do randomization, what do you see? I mean, if I chose uh, I1 and I2 in clock cycle one. The sec, I mean, and the code was the same. So let's say the thermometer code was two all along. In randomization, I will choose I1 and I2 in the let's say in the first cycle. The next time I get two, I could choose say I1 and I3 or I2 and I3 or I7 and I8. In other words, more importantly, I can repeat some of the current sources I have used already in the previous cycle because it's simply random. Okay. On the other hand. Okay, this algorithm which is called data weighted averaging basically will start, will use successive current sources always. Okay, however, the bottom lower tip of the place from which you start will depend on the previous data. Does this make sense? Okay, so, uh, uh, so for example, if I had a constant input into the D2A converter. Alright, how quickly do you think I'll be able to cover the entire bunch of current sources? For data weighted averaging, let's say I had eight current sources and the input sequence was two. So, for in the first cycle, I will choose I1 plus uh, I2, then I3 plus I4, okay, I5 plus I6, and I7 plus I8, and then come back again to I1 plus I2. Whereas if I had randomization, okay. So let's say I had a constant sequence two with DWA. I will have I one plus I two, I three plus I four, I five plus. I6 and I7 plus I8. With randomization, what will I have? I could have, for example, I1 plus I3, okay, some other uh, I2 plus I8, blah, 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 okay. So, in which of these uh, schemes do you think the, the, uh, uh, I will cover all the current sequence, I mean, all the current sources more rapidly? Pardon? Uh, the DWA algorithm will cause the, you know, uh, the uh, cause the current sources, all the current sources, to be used as rapidly as possible. Okay. So what does that mean? Very good. So if you use all the current sources as rapidly as possible, okay, the averaging will happen very quickly in a in the DWA case. Whereas it will happen more slowly in the randomization case. Okay. In other words, what does that mean? If the averaging happens very quickly in uh, in the DWA case, what does that mean spectrally? If the averaging happens much quickly. I mean, much more quickly in the DWA case, it means that this mismatch, the error due to mismatch, okay, has more attenuation at low frequencies, alright, when compared to randomization. You will have, yes, you will still have harmonics, but they will be greatly attenuated because of this. Okay, and please uh, note, yeah, uh, that is true. Mm. So it is well known that if you, def you, I mean, if you put in a constant input signal, you can see that there will be tones clearly, right? So if I put two as the input, okay, the output will be I1 plus I, you know, I2, blah 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 blah, and clearly, after it has covered the entire all the eight sources, 
it will repeat again. So, there will definitely be harmonics at ok. So, ok. So, when compared to a uh, so the question now is basically how do you implement the algorithm hmm? and the key point is to observe that all the time you are choosing only contiguous current sources correct and every time you have an input you need to move the pointer you are starting at some point in this array and then choosing I mean how many I mean uh, let us say the input core was 3 so you start from some pointer Alright, choose three current sources which are contiguous and compute the uh, increment the pointer so that you know it points to uh, three plus the previous point. Okay, so you start again. Does this make sense? You understand? So uh, and uh, so what uh, the way this is implemented is the following. So the data valid averaging is a very uh, very popular algorithm and as we showed it results in first order noise shaping of the noise due to mismatch in the unit elements of the DAM and you can see the four that now how do you implement it the output of the flash converter is going to be a thermometer alright you convert it into binary and then you pass it through an accumulator this is the the accumulator which goes on no this is not the stuff that goes into the DAC input this is the pointer the pointer must be controlled by an accumulator because the, the pointer uh, the value it points to now is the what it was pointing to earlier plus the present port ok and what else do you need to do? You uh, in the, so uh, you need to start from the pointer and then go. How many ever codes that you need to? How many ever current sources that you need to excite? Okay. So if the uh, so in other words, you basically need some kind of you need a shifter. You need basically a barrel shifter. Okay. So uh, and one uh, neat way of implementing a barrel shifter is is the so called you know uh, this binary shifter where you have one layer of logic which shifts the input completely by by one ok this I mean this, this is controlled by the LSB so when S0 is uh, let us say 0 the input goes through directly alright when the when S0 these are all muxes ok uh, when S0 is 1, B1, I mean this path is active. When S0 is 0, this path is active. When S0 is 1, this path is active. Okay. So, if S0 is 0, all the things get con connected directly to, directly through. Alright. If S0 is 1, what happens? All of them shift by 1. Okay, and there is a wrap around which basically causes the output to I mean B8 to get back to B1. Does that make sense? Okay. The this one shifts everything by 2 and this one shifts everything by 4. Alright. So by a suitable combination of uh, S0, S1 and S2, you can shift the input thermometer. Alright. Let's say the input thermometer code was uh, like this ok uh, if only S0 was 1 and all the others were 0 the output thermometer code will basically do this you understand and if S1 was 1 then you know this resulting output will get shifted by 2 again so by so you can basically by uh, choosing S0, S1 and S2 appropriately you can shift the thermometer position anywhere from 0 to 8 all right and so this will also have delay in the power. yes all this will have delay so anything you have to do to fool around with so this is the same as the scan for the 
Yes, I mean, so, uh, I mean, this only, the only difference between this and the randomization stuff is the way it processes the, the error. Alright? In randomization, what did we see? The distortion will just get converted into noise floor, so it's flat. Okay, the error due to mismatch is flat within the signal band. Okay? Here, what happens? The noise due error due to mismatch is actually shaped by a first order high pass filter, so the spectrum will be, will look like this rather than flat. Does that make sense? Alright? So, the, so S0, S1, S2 represent the pointer at which you start accumulating, I mean where you start selecting the, the contiguous current sources and that is controlled by this accumulator here. Does that make sense? So, of course, all this stuff has got delay, ok. The critical path is through the accumulator. So, you have to convert from thermometer to binary, you accumulate it, alright, use that to go and set the switches up, ok. And and once you turn the switches to the right positions, that is when the output sequence will be correct. Okay. So, all this takes time. So, at high frequencies, this is indeed a problem. I mean, I do not have solutions, but this uh, all I can say is it is a it is an issue. And this shows the spectrum. This is the ideal this is no DWA, alright, this is with DWA, data weighted averaging, you can see definitely that there is a tone, I mean the components are, the error sequence is periodic, so there is a tone. Alright, and uh, however you can see that this tone has vanished. Why? Why do you think that's true? I mean, how come this tone was bigger to begin with? How come it uh, this doesn't appear in the out final output, whereas this appears? Pardon? Huh? Yeah. No, no, no. Yeah, so please note that this is getting filtered by 1 minus z inverse, okay, which is the transfer function of the differentiate. Alright? So the, the attenuation of this tone will be much larger than the attenuation of this tone. Does that make sense? Alright. Okay. So you can see that thanks to DWA, you are doing, you know, it is almost close to the, it is rather very close to the ideal one. And uh, as I pointed out, DWA also has the problem of tones in the signal. Does that make sense? Okay. So this is how the modulator would look. So, this is the A to D, this is the barrel shifter. The barrel shifter shift is controlled by a thermometer to binary controller, you know, converter and a accumulator which keeps figuring out where the pointer must start. Hmm? Yes. Alright. So, when do you think the lowest frequency tones will come? Let us say I have a DAC whose elements are, you know, whatever, controlled by this uh, DWA, whose choice of elements is controlled by this data weighted averaging algorithm. Where do you think the, the lowest frequency tones will come? When the input is smallest, correct? So, you, I mean, the, uh, the tones will get averaged out quick, quickest when the 
when the input is in the middle, not when the input is the largest. Okay? Alright? So when the, when the input is in the middle, you will get, you know, E1 plus E2 plus E3 plus E4 as the error sequence in the first instance. Then E5 plus E6 plus E7 plus E8. Then again, 1 through 4, 4 through 8 and so on. So this looks like a sequence with at pi. Okay? Whereas if the input was just 1, then to do data weight averaging, what will happen? I will get E1, E2, E3, E4, E5, E6, E7, E8. Again, it will repeat. So this will see tones at fs by 8. Does it make sense? Okay? When it is 7, not when it is 8. I mean, when it is 8, then it is 8, 8, 8, 8, 8. Yeah, that's okay. Only when it is 7, what happens is you can think of it as 8 minus the top 1, 8 minus the top 2 and so on. So, alright? Okay, so I think I will skip. So, there are, as I said, you know, there are a bazillion ways of doing uh, uh, dynamic element matching and uh, most of them are what you call uh, somewhat ad hoc. Okay? Uh, so, this was again one of those early algorithms which is called individual level averaging where again you exploit the fact that when you average out all possible choices you get it's zero, the error is zero. Okay, you get the ideal LSB. Hmm? So, for each choice, you know you can, I mean for each input code you can keep track of what current sources you have used in the past and use you know, don't use those current sources that you use in the past. For example, if the input code was 1, okay, so you have a pointer for the code 1, alright, the first time you get 1, you choose I1, okay, then the input code is 2, you have a pointer, when the input code is 2, you choose I1 and I2, the next time I get 2, what would I do? I want to average as quickly as possible. So what should I do? I don't choose I, I1 and I2. I choose I3 and I4. Okay? Alright? Then for, for code 3 I have another, I have a point, separate pointer. So I choose I1, I2 and I3 when I get 3. Okay? The next time I get 3 I choose I4, I5 and I6. Alright? And Similarly, so for every code I need to have a pointer, so you can think of this as some kind of, you know, it's very analogous to DWA, but seems like a whole lot more complicated, right, because I need to have 8 pointers and 8 accumulators and the whole thing seems like a pretty nasty affair, okay. But nevertheless, uh, this was proposed before data weighted averaging, okay. I think now data weighted averaging is, uh, you know, actually pretty routine technique, so everybody simply uses DWA simply because of ease of implementation and you know, performance you get. So, and uh, you can do, you know, any number of, you know, variants of uh, data weighted averaging. One is to do, you know, it's called, so as you can see, you know, every guy who comes up with an algorithm has got uh, a fancy name to it, okay. Uh, you can split up the arrays as two arrays and two DWA on each one of them separately ok and you find some minor improvements and uh, instead of doing modulo instead of going all the way up and coming starting from one again you can go all the way up and come down it's a big deal you know it's all they're all huh? what do you call uh, I think mostly academic exercises uh, it's not uh, the uh, merits of one over the other or you know and you can always find an input sequence which will screw any algorithm, okay? Because all, all that it makes, uh, all that you need to find out is how the algorithm is working, and you should be it is quite straightforward to come up with algorithm. I mean, seek input sequences which can result in tones or you know whatever. So, and then there's this. Uh, it turns out this is actually a fairly systematic way of doing what is called high order mismatch noise shaping, okay? Where you take the error due to mismatch and you can shape it in data weight averaging, we saw it was 1 minus z inverse, you can actually make it, you know, 1 minus z inverse to the power n, okay. And you, people found that, uh, you know, uh, this is a uh, very, and this is, I think, uh, this is what Schreier came up with, right, but uh, the implementation becomes very, very complicated and uh, 
beyond 1 minus e inverse the complexity of this engine becomes uh, quite a lot so uh, you know a lot of people don't do it and if you want 1 minus e inverse you can do data weighted averaging anyway alright so I am not going to get into the details of this and uh, ok so the bottom line is that data weighted averaging is seems to be the best compromise between complexity and performance and uh, and we have used it in several data converters and we found that it is quite alright hmm? ok then uh, I mean so the other class of algorithms uh, not algorithms really circuit techniques is to say that let us forget about all this uh, dynamic element matching because it introduces delay in the loop alright what if somehow I measured each one of these unit elements and made them all equal ok so I have some kind of calibration cycle where I measure each one of these individual current sources ok compare it with some reference and you know use negative feedback to go and correct the value of these current sources so that all the current sources are equal to some master reference in which case you know I do not need I mean the current sources are very well matched to begin with so I do not need any of this this you know averaging and all this other stuff ok so all right so that is the uh, uh, the uh, scoop on uh, dynamic element matching all right so in the next class which is tomorrow we will talk about uh, the next non ideal effect which is clock jitter Okay, and I hope to complete uh, that stuff tomorrow in which case uh, so are you guys in a position to do the second assignment or I mean the order the seventh assignment or not yet no I mean not uh, not saying I, I mean do you have enough time to do it I am just saying are you technically competent to do it now or uh, uh, no ok so oh, how many of you at least started 